front were two Horangi, who had become one of the country's richest tribes. They provided the guides to take the tourists to see the terraces, as well as supplying evening entertainment in the form of haka performances. More money was also made by charging a fee for painting or taking photographs of the terraces. At that time, the natives were very cheery about allowing anyone to sketch or take photos at Rotomahana. They demanded five pounds for the merest drawing or negative, so that no important paintings had been attempted by any artist. Any sketch had to be taken surreptitiously, and if the culprit was caught, he had to either pay their exorbitant price, or the sketches would be taken away from him and destroyed. Charles Blomfield. Charles Blomfield was one of a number of painters and photographers that were drawn by the extraordinary beauty of the terraces. It is his paintings that give us the clearest sense of how they once looked. Mr. Blomfield was so privileged to go on the terraces because grandfather persuaded the Maoris to allow him to because he was such a good artist. And uh, therefore they allowed him to go and he he pitched his tent there and had his little daughter staying with him while he was painting the terraces. And Mother considers that Mr. Blomfield's pictures were the most authentic. He got um, Hazard to make arrangements with the Maori chief that if he paid one lump sum he could stay as long as he liked and paint as, as many pictures as he liked. And this took quite some time, but eventually it was all settled, and he took his nine-year-old daughter, who was my eldest aunt. My little girl, far from being lonely, amused herself splendidly, bathing in the hot basins, making mud pies, plastering up the baby mud volcanoes with clay to hear them go off with a pop, hunting for petrified ferns and birds' feathers in the hot water. She got so used to the strange, weird sights that she skipped about fearlessly among the geysers, greatly to the horror of the visitors who hardly dared venture out of the guide's footsteps. Often on a moonlit night, I would take the boat and leaving my little Mary fast asleep in the tent, pull slowly around the lake. It was a most uncanny experience. The mysterious shroud of vapor, the absolute solitude, the strange weird sounds on every hand, hissing, gurgling, muttering, moaning, sighing, seemed like some unknown world, while every few yards a wild duck would rise from the water with a startled cry and vanish in the gloom. Charles Blomfield. By May 1886, strange events were developing at Tarawera. Fractures deep under the mountain had widened. Other, weaker structures were now taking the strain of the molten rock pushing from below, while above the ground, a strange sickness had overtaken the Maori population at Tiwairo. Sir, I have the honour to inform you of a serious falling off in the attendance at my school. For the last month there has been a constant wail for the dead, and I have not known so many deaths to occur in the same space of time since I came here. Charles Hazard, May 15, 1886. The Hazards were probably Tiwairo's best-known European family. Charles was the school teacher, and his eldest daughter, Clara, assisted him. Charles also acted as the local pharmacist, but his meagre resources were quickly depleted by the spreading contagion. There had been a succession of tangi, or funerals. These now numbered around 20 of the 120 Māori at Te Wairua. Europeans attributed these deaths to typhoid and respiratory diseases, but many Māori interpreted them as a tuhu, a sign that something was not right. This feeling was compounded when one of the local chiefs, Apuro Te Farikanefa, fell ill. Te Farikanefa had been actively encouraging his people, Ngāti Hinamihi, into tourism, and in so doing had upset to Haurangi's ancient spiritual leader, the Tohunga Tuhoto Ariki. Tuhoto was reputed to be over 100 years old. He spoke no English, and even his Māori was so archaic that few understood it. The Māori people were frightened of Tuhoto. They were frightened of his powers. He was believed to have the power of Makutu. He could, he could offer a curse against people, which was a very, very dangerous thing. He could read the future, that man. 
he knew what he was doing. He could talk to people that you and I will never see. Tuhoto and Tefari Kanafa were especially divided over the entertainment of tourists in the tribe's meeting house, the Farai Hinemihi. In Tuhoto's view, this was a breach of the tapu, the sacredness of the house. Perhaps worst of all was the ostentatious display of the tribe's wealth inside the Farai. The eyes of the carvings of ancestors were decorated not with the traditional power shell, but with tourist coins. It's like the feeling that I have. This is my culture. I don't want it to be despoiled by commerce. This is how I feel in some of my, my thinking today. And I'm quite sure there would have been some of our people at that time who would have felt the same way. In April, Tefari Kanefa lost his temper and struck Tuhoto, the worst possible affront to his tapu. Tuhoto immediately pronounced a curse on him, adding cryptically that before long, something else will happen. By early May, Tefari Kanefa was ill. He declined rapidly and on the 23rd of May, he died. He struck uh, two of them. And he paid for it. Not long after that, he died. Not long after that, bang, on the mountain. On May the 30th, Louise and George Sice and their daughter Fanny checked into the Rotomahana Hotel. My grandfather and grandmother and my aunt Frances were on a holiday trip to the North Island at the time and uh, they decided to visit the pink and white terraces. Through the hotel's proprietor, Joseph McRae, the Sices engaged a guide. We were accompanied by the celebrated guide, Sophia, a splendid woman who is well versed in Maori history. She speaks pure English, writes a fine hand, has a remarkably sweet voice, fine features, and carries herself like a goddess. Louise sighs. She had a sense of humor that appealed to everyone. She was attractive, and she was able to show those visitors uh, whatever they wanted. She had full control of, of affairs, and, um, and she has been remembered affectionately ever since. On the morning of May the 31st came the first clear indication of the events occurring beneath the ground. When Sophia escorted the Sices down to the lake to begin their trip, they found the water had disappeared. We started walking for the boats and when we got down to the creek, found it was all dry. There was no water and the boats were stuck in the mud. When I saw this I was astonished, for the boats here used to float in plenty of water. We heard the water returning with the crying, moaning sound. Hoo, 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 it whimpered as it swept around the edges of the shore. The boatmen and other natives looked at each other, not understanding this strange thing. So fire Hinirangi. This was a sign that deep underground the Earth's crust was fracturing, opening up a path by which the magma could begin its upward journey. But it was not this so much as the events that followed that have baffled people ever since. The sighting of the phantom canoe. So we started, and the charm of the row across Lake Tarawera is a thing never to be forgotten. The water was like glass, and I must tell you that although very deep, you can see the bottom, it is so clear. The distance across Tarawera is seven miles, and on our way, an incident occurred which, in the light of what happened afterwards, does seem strange, although you know that neither George nor I are believers in the supernatural. Louise sighs. My grandfather, George Sice, from what I can gather, uh, was certainly not a superstitious man. He was very level-headed and uh, a practical man. While skirting the southern shore, we were startled by a peculiar cry from an old Maori woman who was with us on her way home after being at the Tangi in Te Wairoa. Seeking the cause of her alarm, we turned towards her, and there she stood pointing over the lake and muttering at the same time a dirge-like croon we distinctly saw a Maori war canoe gliding along, nearly parallel to and apparently racing us. 
George Size. No one had seen a war canoe on Lake Tarawira for many, many years. And suddenly this canoe, according to these informants, appeared. The Maoris say it was a phantom canoe and at once predicted the end of the world, which, strangely enough, came for most of them a few days after, 